In this video today, I'm gonna to break down how I create my bass tone. We're gonna talk about starting all the way from the bass itself to the kind of strings you use, the picks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna go through the pedal board and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do in the box when I'm making videos or if I'm mixing a song or whatever, how I treat bass in the box. What's up guys, editor Dave here and I'm editing this video right now and I'm realizing I should have split this up into two parts. And so I'm going to split this up into two parts. Um, and the first part's gonna be all about the pedal board, all about the bass, all about everything we do before we record the bass to get the tone. And then the second part, the second video is only gonna be inside Pro Tools, talking about plugins, EQ, compression, yada, yada, all that stuff on the back end. So without further ado, here is part one, and this is bass, strings, pedals, all that good stuff. First thing that's important, obviously, is having a bass. Um, I love my, I have a Getty Lee jazz bass, Fender jazz bass. Pretty sure it was made in Japan, might have been made in Mexico, I don't really know. Don't really care, because it sounds great. So the only pickup I've replaced as well is the neck pickup. I have a Lawler neck pickup in it, I'll link that down below. I love it. I mean, as with a lot of the things on the board and even in the box, a lot of the moves we're making are subtle little steps that slowly add up. And I think the Lawler pickup is a great addition. It's definitely not required, but I like how it brings a little more clarity to the low mids. I feel like the top end is a little more pleasant. And so, yeah, I, I enjoy that because I, for the most part, 90% of the time, I'm only using the neck pickup. I'm not using any of the bridge pickup. And then I've got my tone all the way up. So that's the bass, right? Gotta have a bass. If you want different pickups, get those, you know. And then we've got, what, what strings do I use, right? I use um, Diodario NYXL mediums. I might actually experiment with some lights as well, but the mediums have been great for me. I feel like the low E string isn't too thick that you don't have control, but it's thick enough that you're not losing a ton of sustain or low end or anything like that. And the advantage for me for the NYXLs over just the normal Diodarios is number one, I feel like they last longer. And number two, similar thing to the neck pickup, I feel like I just get a little bit different clarity. They're kind of carving out some of the frequencies already that I would have gotten rid of eventually anyway, I feel like. But overall, they just last longer, which is huge because a big key to the way I like to design my tone is fresh strings. Having fresh strings is honestly huge because as your strings get older and they get deader, they lose sustain, they lose top end clarity. And that sustain is where a lot of your low end comes from as well. So you're losing low end sustain, you're losing clarity, you lose aggression, and it's not good to try to compensate on your preamp or on your EQ pedal or whatever. So keep the strings fresh, that's huge. And then before we get into the pedals, I like to use the, uh, the green Dunlops. They're a uh, 0.88 millimeter. And the same thing with fresh strings, I find that fresh picks are a must for me. Something about the, the edge that they have when they're brand new just thwacks the string in a very pleasant way to me. So gotta have fresh strings, gotta have fresh picks. How do you keep your strings fresh? You wash your hands, kids, okay? Uh, worship is all about clean hands and a pure heart, especially the clean hands when you're a bass player. You know what I mean? So anyway, let's dive into the pedals. The center of attention, besides Jesus, is the tone hammer. The tone hammer is, let's call it a must. The tone hammer is a must for the way that I like to build my tone. So if you're just getting started, my first recommendation is get a tone hammer. That's just me. A lot of different people use different things. I know the HX stomps are really big these days. I personally haven't used one. I don't mind the way they sound, but I just love the way that this sounds. So I'm not really in the mood to change, TBH. So this is the center of attention, in my opinion. So I can show you what it's like to not have it on at all. So if I turn off the tone hammer, we're just hearing, obviously we're hearing the buffer not making a huge difference. 
We're hearing the RNDI making a subtle difference as well. I can talk about that later. But this is no tone hammer, no nothing. So that's like a little bit more of your dad bass tone, right? Get that's all neck pickup, by the way. So it doesn't sound bad, but it just doesn't have the meat, the grit, the dirt that we're looking for. Why are we looking for that? Because honestly, tone is in the mid range to me, like having good low end as a bass player should be a given. So the way we define our tone is in the mid range and people hear low end in the mid range. That's the interesting thing because we don't really hear anything like in those sub harmonic zones. That's what we feel. So at church, that's what's coming out of the subs. But when people are listening to something on their phone, they're not hearing, their phone isn't reproducing 80 Hertz, you know? So what we're hearing are the harmonics of those root notes. So we want to lean into that. We want to give a harmonically rich signal. So the way we do that, if I just engage it, all I'm hearing is the EQ now. But the magic of this pedal or this preamp rather is the AGS circuit, or I think it's advanced gain stage, something like that. So this is without. And this is with. As you can hear, we're losing a little bit of that top end, like top, top, top end shine, but we're gaining a lot of grit and we're getting a little natural kind of compression from everything. So I love the way that the tone hammer glues everything together, especially as we start adding things in the chain. Having it at the end kind of helps glue everything together before we send it out, right? So this is huge, this is central, would be my first recommendation. So how do I set up the EQ and everything? This is just how I've learned to do it over the years. This is kind of a good starting place for me is I kind of have my gain where it is and my master where it is. The gain is the input, the master is the output. So the gain affects how gritty the tone is. I don't want it that gritty personally because I'm gonna be using some other pedals or techniques to get different levels of dynamics. So I wanna be able to set the gain where if I want it to be clean, I can just play a little bit lighter. Or if I dig in with a pick. we still have the same amount of grit. So I wanna set this up in a dynamic way. So this is how I usually set my gain and my master. And then I usually kind of have my, my treble and bass opposing each other. I boost a little bit of low end. Usually I'm ducking just a touch of the top end. This is all gonna be dependent on what bass you're using and what pickups you have and all that stuff. The mid zone is where we wanna kind of look. So I believe that the mid frequency sweeps from like, oh golly. Maybe I want to say it's like 400 to 4K. I don't know. When I'm like dialing it in fresh, what I'll do is I'll kind of just boost the mid level and then kind of listen. And I usually end up somewhere around here, whatever frequency that is. And I usually end up cutting it a similar amount. And that just feels like it makes room for the frequencies that I want to make room for. So. That's how I set up my tone hammer. Like I said, very central. My, my first recommendation to people who don't have anything and they're starting fresh. But from there, let's start at the beginning of the chain. So I started with the tone hammer because I feel like it's super important, but let's go from the beginning. So out of my bass, we're running into the Pinstripe Pedals MBFR. To be honest, this might be a little bit of a I can't tell if my ears are hearing what I want them to hear, if they're tricking me, but I did some A-B testing, you know, maybe six or so months ago when I first got this and I enjoyed how, on this, this first output. I know a lot of my guitar friends, I think they enjoy maybe more the second output, but they're two different transformers in there. But it, basically what a buffer is doing, and I'm gonna say this probably wrong or in a stupid way, you could ask a guitar player because they have to worry about it more. 
from what I understand, it's kind of in a way boosting the integrity, I guess, of your signal. Because the more, the more that your audio has to go through these cables, right, the longer the, the total cableage. So we're not, all, we're not only talking about from the guitar to the pedal board, but each of these patch cables is adding feet of unbalanced cables, which are these TS cables. The more you have, especially your guitar player, if you have a million pedals, you know, that's a lot of cableage. That's a lot of cables. And so you're losing signal quality. So a buffer is meant to kind of counteract that. For me, obviously I don't have a ton of pedals, but I was just curious how it would sound on bass. I had a, another friend here, Tanner, that put one on his board and he was saying he enjoyed it. So I just got one because my friend David is a dealer for them and was like, I'm just going to try this out. And it stayed and that's that. So check them out. They're a cool company. They make a bunch of other stuff too for guitar players and, and all that. So we come out of the buffer and we go into the, to be honest, I have no idea what the signal path is. I know that the microsynth is before the fuzz. And I'm pretty sure the fuzz goes in the tone hammer, so that means that the buffer must go into the tuner. The tuner must go into the microsynth. The microsynth must go into the fuzz. Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure that's right. My friend David, the the dealer for Pinstripe, he built this for me. And he's the pedal guru. So take your pedal board to him or take your pedals or ship all your pedals to him and he'll build it and he'll ship it to you. Paleo Guitars, he is the man. He works on guitars as well. He's awesome. He builds guitars as well. So so out of the buffer, we go into the tuner. Gotta have a tuner. You gotta be in tune, period. Moving on. Then we go into the micro synth. I get questions about this because it may not look like your micro synth because your micro synth and the micro synth I had before this one was smaller. It was a little guy. It was a boop. Yeah, it was fine. I was always having issues. I went through two or three and I was having issues where I would kick it on and then like 30 or 45 seconds later, it would kind of start to just lose aggression. Like the low end would stay the same, but it would just start to, and I'd have to kind of turn it off and turn it back on to like get that aggression back. So I was getting really frustrated. So I was like, you know what, what the heck? I'm gonna buy one of these vintage big box ones. Yeah, it's not even that vintage, it's from the 90s. Um, but to me, it not only does it take up a heck of a lot more space, so that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. It just sounds a little, I would say that maybe the low end is a little more full on the modern one, the smaller one. But something about this one, it just has this mid-range aggression that I'm a fan of. And I just, I know it's still digital. Like there's nothing less digital about it to my knowledge, but it sounds less digital to me than the, the current one. So again, so much of tone and everything is subjective and I could just be, pulling this out of my butt and I could just be hearing what I want to hear. I have no idea, but to me, it sounds better. It feels better because I don't have that dropping out problem. So overall, whether it sounds better or not, it's more reliable, which is a good thing. This is what it sounds like. This is how I, you can see, I, I'm not going to really explain because look at it. You can see it right there. So this is without, this is with. Sounds awesome. Little rule of thumb for you. I try to not play anything below the A. So the open A string or the fifth fret on the E string. I don't play anything when I have the micro synth on. I don't play anything below that. Because we're adding an octave below this octave. And if what I remember is correct, the octave below this string is my piano sounds so bad. The octave below the string is that note. It's the lowest note on the piano. So basically, don't go below that. I do in uh, Awestruck Revival, Gable Price and Friends. I'm pretty sure I hit a G. It doesn't sound bad, but I mean, at that point, no speaker is probably re like reproducing that very well. So I don't know. Maybe not no speaker, but just, it's a thought. Just keep it in mind. I try not to. This is the lowest I go. Because to me, its point is to be able to, you know, add a dynamic level, but go high and keep low end, you know, that low root note going. So that's awesome. And then we get to the kill. I rave about this thing all the time. It sounds insane on bass and I just love it. I just love it so much. So I never want to take it off my bass board ever. And what I love, especially about this one, this is the V1, 
is it's got a dedicated boost and a dedicated drive. So depending on how you flip these switches, you can either have, let's find out, let's find out together, okay? So I'm gonna switch both switches down and these switches affect the yellow side. So this is the yellow side with both switches down. So before. So just kind of. Honestly, sounds really sick. Let's switch one up. Really, like a lot of mid-range there. And then just G2 up. That sounds awesome. And then, this is the way I use it. If you flip them both up, it's a fuzz. Other thing I love about the V1 is it's got this low cut switch. So I obviously keep that off because we're playing bass. We want all that low end to come through. So if you flip it on, it sounds like this. Would be a cool layer, but when we need that low end. Sounds insane, right? Okay, love that. So as you can see, these are the way I set my knobs. I set them all at basically 10 o'clock. That's just where I've found to be the sweet spot over the last couple of years of using it. And then I also really enjoy using the boost side as well, just for like a little step up from the clean tone, right? So if this is my clean tone. Here's the boost. So it's just got a little bit of teeth. And then, so it's like, this is stage one, if you will. This is maybe stage two. And then if I really need to go all the way, maybe I'll kick both of these on together, have the low octave. You know what I mean? So that's all of our gain stages, if you will. I try to keep myself from getting too crazy. Some so Not every song needs a pedal change on bass. Like some songs, it's like I'm just on the tone hammer the whole time. And it's a good discipline to have to not kick on the microsynth every song, every last chorus, every big bridge, whatever, although tempting it may be. And that finally brings us to this little black box, this little black beauty, the Neve RNDI, right? Reeve, Newport, Design, Newport, Reeve... Wait, Reed, Reeve Newpert, Rupert Neve Designs, Direct Injection. I'm lost. Get the RNDI right. It's sick. Super unneeded. Probably, well, not super unneeded. If you're getting started, this is the order I would buy things in. Bass, tuner, tone hammer, microsynth. The strings and the picks are included in the bass. And then once you get maybe a microsynth, maybe you either get another pedal or you get a DI, but you don't need this. But it, I think it sounds good. Like I said in the very beginning, it's those little steps that just add up and make the tone we're hearing. So what I like about the RNDI is, again, the same way the tone hammer's kind of gluing everything together, I think the RNDI is just one more step of that. It's like, kind of just hugs everything together. I feel like it smooths out the top end in a, in a pleasant way. So the tone hammer can get a little aggressive in the treble. That's sometimes why I turn the treble down a little bit because when you have the AGS engaged, all of those extra harmonics, they're getting pushed in. And uh, I just find that the way that the RNDI kind of smooths out that top end a little bit is nice to me. So again, my ears could be playing tricks. Maybe I just want to believe that it was worth the $400 or whatever it was. That's just my opinion on, on that. So Definitely not a requirement, but a fun purchase. So now that we've kind of gone through our pedal board and you know talked about bass, talked about strings, picks, all the pedals, now we're gonna hop into Pro Tools and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I process a bass guitar in the box when I'm either making YouTube videos or mixing songs for records or whatever, you know, so. All right, so that was part one. We just covered all of the pedal board stuff, the bass, the strings, all that good stuff. Head over to part two. I'll put it on the screen or link it in the description or something uh, to check out what we do now that we've recorded our bass. How do we EQ it? How do we compress it? How do we process it in the mix stage? Go to the next video, part two in Pro Tools to check that out. And hey, if you liked this one, 
It would really mean a lot to me if you liked the video, it really does help. And if you wanna see my future videos, make sure you're subscribed. Um, thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.